Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. I bow at the lotus feet of my Guru Paramhansa Yogananda and I bow to his great lineage of teachers, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai and Swami Shri Yukteswar Giri. And I bow to my divine friend and guide, Swami Kriyananda. So friends, welcome to the 11th episode of the series on the Mahabharata. In the last episode, we saw what was one of the most critical turning points in the story of the Mahabharata, the marriage of Draupadi to the Pandava brothers, uh, where Arjuna won the contest by defeating all the other princes and kings that showed up and ended up winning the hand of Draupadi and eventually she married all the five Pandava brothers. Now, there are a few things that are very important for us to note from last week's episode as we move forward. The first one, of course, is the fact that because of Arjuna showing up and winning this, winning this contest, uh, it has become pretty clear and obvious to everyone that the Pandava brothers are not dead and they are alive and doing well and living with their mother Kunti. So it won't be very far before uh, they return to the palace of Hastinapura. The second thing for us to note is the appearance of Krishna in the scene. As we saw last week, this is the first time in the story of Mahabharata that Krishna officially makes an appearance. And as we saw already in the previous episodes, what Krishna represents is the intuitive guidance, the seed of superconsciousness that resides within us. He is divine incarnate because that seed of superconsciousness is nothing but a part of God consciousness. So, um, and in a way, what he represents is the consciousness of a guru, uh, the guiding force that is always reflecting our own highest potential. So his appearance in the scene is extremely significant. Uh, in the Indian tradition, it is always said that you cannot go hunting for a guru. You cannot run to the mountains or to the forests or anywhere uh, trying to find your guru. When you're ready, when your consciousness is expanded enough to be able to be receptive, the guru automatically appears in front of you. So the appearance of Krishna represents that moment, uh, that moment in our own spiritual journey where we are receptive enough that the Guru shows up and all the austerities that the Pandavas have gone through so far has brought them to, brought them to that point. And once you have found your Guru, uh, the rest of the spiritual path is nothing but simply uh, the constant uh, effort for us to attune ourselves uh, to the consciousness of the Guru, which is what we are going to see as we move forward with the story. The third point that is important for us to note, even from a practical perspective, uh, standpoint of the story and what's happening with the characters is that um, as much as the Pandavas have been alone living in the forest so far with their mother, you know, living this life of great austerity without any belongings, just uh, leading a very nomadic life, now they have very strong allies. Uh, after the marriage of Draupadi, King Drupada, the father of Draupadi, becomes their patron. He takes care of them and now they are living in the palace. <clears throat> so uh, they have an ally with the King Drupada and all his armies from the kingdom of Panchala. And the other strong ally they have is Krishna, not merely as a guru, but also as a great ruler and one who has a very strong army because the entire Yadava clan uh, is, is an army of Krishna. So he is also a powerful king. Uh, both Drupada and Krishna are now allies of uh, the Pandava brothers. So that is important for us to note because when they return back to the palace, there is already this very apparent animosity that's, that is built between the Pandava and the Kaurava brothers. So everybody has to remember that the Pandavas are not alone. If the kingdom of uh, Hastinapura and the royal family is going to side with the Kauravas, the Pandavas are already building up their warring clan as well. Uh, so. Those are some of the important developments that happen. And uh, like I said, it is not just the literal story that is unfolding. Allegorically, uh, that ascent of Kundalini brings all this along. Now the Pandavas are strong. They are no longer alone. And their spiritual power cannot be challenged. They cannot be vanquished. They still may not uh, have ascended the throne of Hastinapura, but they, you know somebody cannot just do away with them. It's not easy to kill them because now they're being protected by all these armies. So that is an extremely critical turning point uh, that happened with the marriage of Draupadi. Now, as the news reaches Hastinapura, Dhritarashtra hears what has happened. Uh, in fact, Vidura 
uh, goes to Dhritarashtra and gives him the news that uh, the princess of Hastinapura have won the hand of uh, Draupadi, uh, the daughter of King Drupada. And Dhritarashtra is elated, thinking it was perhaps Duryodhana who actually married Draupadi, but then learns that it was uh, Arjuna and all the Pandava brothers who are actually now married to Draupadi. Um, you know, uh, the kingdom right now is ruled by Dhritarashtra, who represents the blind mind. That in itself says quite a lot. Uh, the blind mind, as we saw, does not have innate perception. That's why Dhritarashtra is blind, in fact. And he's constantly being swayed and influenced by the power of desires, which is Gandhari, all the material uh, delusions that we hold on to, which is represented by Duryodhana and all the Karva brothers, by Shakuni, by Karna, and all the other negative characters now residing in the palace of Hastinapura. So as soon as Vidura gives Dhritarashtra the news, uh, for a moment he's elated. Oh, the Pandava brothers are not dead. They are in fact like my sons. They are the sons of my brothers and I've been taking care of them. So I'm so glad they are going to be returning to the palace. But not uh, uh, not very long after, uh, Duryodhana and Shakuni and Karna also enter the picture and they start telling Dhritarashtra all the reasons why this is a bad omen, how now Duryodhana has claimed right to the throne and when the Pandava brothers enter the palace, it's not going to be pleasant. Now there's going to be animosity and uh, they build a case for how Yudhishthira, now with the support of King Drupada, Krishna and all these powerful armies might try to oust Duryodhana and that uh, Duryodhana will have no place and that the Karva brothers will again have to uh, leave the palace because the Pandavas are taking charge of the kingdom. Of course, all of this is not true at all because the Pandavas don't have any such intentions. Uh, but Dhritarashtra is swayed because he is in fact the blind mind by all of this. And uh, Vidura sends an invitation for the Pandava brothers to come back to the palace. So uh, the party of seven, the five Pandava brothers, Kunti and Draupadi, uh, arrive at the palace of Hastinapura and they're welcomed uh, as part of the royal family with uh, great uh, grand celebrations because they have brought a bride uh, who could potentially be the queen of Hastinapura. So uh, they get a royal welcome when they come back. Interestingly enough, Gandhari, her first instinct when she encounters Draupadi, she immediately realizes uh, or feels that this is an extremely bad omen for the kingdom and for her and her sons. Uh, she even makes a statement that uh, Draupadi is like a serpent who has come uh, to destroy her entire family and her generations to come, which is what ends up happening in the war. Uh, even that uh, very metaphor of a serpent is often used with the kundalini energy. So um, Vyasa puts in those references there to make it obvious what's exactly happening. And Gandhari represents the power of desires. So it is not surprising that the ascending kundalini energy is uh, nothing but uh, the end for all these desires and material delusions that are holding us back. Uh, with all of this unfolding and the sides extremely polarized, it soon becomes very clear that they cannot coexist in the same palace. Uh, the animosity is uh, bubbling up to the surface and the Pandavas and Kauravas cannot really look each other into the eye. And uh, Dhritarashtra, as the king, now has to step in and take a decision on what can really happen and how he can, he can resolve the situation. So he... Um, comes to this conclusion and passes this verdict that the kingdom will be divided between the Pandava and the Karva brothers. The main kingdom, the capital, all the riches and all the good parts of the kingdom, uh, which is what Hastinapura includes, uh, will all stay with Dhritarashtra and will be passed on to his sons and Duryodhana especially as the next crown prince. And the Pandavas with Yudhishthira as the crown king will uh, get another part of the uh, kingdom of Hastinapura, a smaller sub-territory that they manage called Khandava Prastha and they can establish their kingdom there and continue to rule in that place. Now as reasonable as it sounds, it's not a fair proposal at all because this region of Khandava Prastha which um, Dhritarashtra is gifting to the Pandavas is actually a cursed region which has been cursed by Indra, the lord of the gods. Uh, for it to be infertile and uh, nothing grows there. It is a completely barren piece of land that has been ruled by uh, under, uh, you know, creatures of the underworld, demons and uncivilized beings of very low vibration, uh, that it's almost impossible to establish a, civ establish a civilized society there. So the Pandavas get an extremely unfair uh, side of the deal and now they have to work with it. 
but as we already saw uh the thing that is different now in our own spiritual journey and in the life of the pandavas is that they are no longer fighting this by themselves they are no longer these spiritual virtues that are trying to save themselves and to do the right thing and to persevere on their own but they now have the guidance of krishna that intuitive guidance the consciousness of the consciousness of the guru that is standing by them for help and support so they do the right thing they go to krishna and ask him for help for that guidance uh to tell them what to do now and krishna comes to rescue not just with all of his resources uh but he also provides a divine architect and uh you know whatever he is able to within his means in order to transform the land and in our own spiritual life it is not that guru steps in and takes care of things for us uh the work ultimately has to be done by us ourselves and that's what the pandavas do uh even something uh as basic as plowing the land which is so rocky and barren they start doing it with their own hands and they start putting in their blood and sweat into building this kingdom into building this land and cultivating and creating uh, a fertile kingdom there and as they start working with it the support of the guru comes many many times multiplied and they're able to transform this land into almost a magical territory that is more fertile and more prosperous by uh, hundreds of times than the kingdom of Hastinapura and as the Kaurava brothers are watching all this they're starting to regret their own decision or their persuasion uh that um, this barren peace could be uh, given to the Pandava brothers and we could get rid of them now they're starting to wonder whether they made the wrong call of course it is not that uh in the land itself was fertile or somehow valuable that they should not have given it away what is actually making them wonder is the is that support and that grace uh that has come to the rescue of the pandava brothers whereas in in the case of the material side uh the delusive forces are satanic they do not have that flow of grace that is constantly protecting and serving them uh compared to the pandava brothers so the kaurava brothers are starting to feel jealous and greedy and uh, uh wondering if they made the right call by giving away Khandava Prastha in fact the kingdom is so fertile and prosperous it is no longer called Khandava Prastha but rather uh it gets gets a new name indra prastha or the land of the gods land of the king of the gods uh because that's how prosperous and fertile the whole kingdom becomes at this point krishna suggests to yudhishthira that he should perform this great sacrifice called rajasuya yagna um uh, it is a it is an extremely great fire sacrifice where uh a king uh you know gathers all of his resources and uh, creates harmonious relationships with all the neighboring kingdoms and uh, all his sub territories and performs the sacrifice announcing to the world that he is now no longer a king but he is an emperor uh so uh yudhishthira is now performing the sacrifice and anybody who opposes that uh decision or that uh fire sacrifice has to be faced in war and the king has to win them over before he can perform this so uh there are some kings that protest and i'm not going to go into the details and uh, yudhishthira wins over and he is performing the sacrifice and uh everybody is invited kings from all over the land and uh, everybody from near and far is invited to take part in the ceremony including the karwa brothers duryodhana shakuni karna uh, vidura all of them also show up so there is this huge and momentous occasion arranged in the palace of indraprastha now being ruled by the emperor yudhishthira where he's performing this great sacrifice uh, duryodhana and karna are feeling almost insulted walking into that palace to see how wealthy and prosperous and uh, fertile this whole land and this palace have become and how happy all the pandava brothers are ruling this kingdom which clearly now looks much better than uh, hastinapura which is uh, the kingdom that dhritarashtra is ruling along with the kaurava brothers so in this uh, sacrifice yudhishthira rightfully so honors krishna as the first and foremost chief guest um, again it is all instructive for us in our own spiritual life uh this whole transformation has been possible not because of the effort of the pandava brothers alone they know that they had to put all that they had into it but it all happened through the grace of god and guru through that grace of krishna who was always standing by them and supporting them so as much as he is uh, only a cousin and a ruler of a smaller territory uh, yudhishthira knows it's appropriate to place him first and foremost in the ceremony because he 
is the reason that the Pandava brothers have been able to receive all that they have received. So this sacrifice takes place and uh, there is another story that happens in this occasion where um, I'm not going to again get into the details of this, but there is this other Yadava ruler named Shishupala who insults Krishna and there is a back and forth that happens. Uh, and there is a promise that Krishna had given to him early on that he would not attack him, but uh, Shishupala violates the terms of that promise. Uh, but at the end of all of this, the point is that uh, Krishna beheads Shishupala in front of everybody in the uh, center of the royal palace as the sacrifice is happening um, uh, to kill Shishupala. Now the whole palace and all the kings assembled there are completely stunned. Uh, Krishna almost uh, brings about uh, a, a superhuman nature. Uh, he displays his strength in a way that people are not used to seeing. Uh, he displays his weapon, which is called the Sudarshana Chakra, uh, which is a disc that is a revolving disc that he holds in his finger. And he uses that disc uh, to behead uh, this person uh, who has been insulting and creating uh, chaos and confusion in this um, sacred fire sacrifice. Now, the point of all this is uh, Duryodhana and Shakuni and Karna are watching all of this and they understand that Krishna is not a normal person. There is something unusual about this man. He is not a normal human being. He in fact is not. He is divine incarnate, both uh, literally in the story of the Mahabharata, but also symbolically and allegorically as he represents that divine consciousness that has descended onto the material plane. So they also get a taste uh, of what um, the power of Krishna is and what is standing behind the Pandava brothers and immediately obviously uh, you know uh the right or the ideal thing for them to do is to venerate and to respect that power when they see it, but rather as as being as representing that negative pole of our consciousness, they cringe. Uh, they uh, uh, look at that div divinity with repulsion, with with contempt. Now they are almost trying to contest the power of Krishna, as we will see moving on, moving forward in the story. They know they cannot stand up against uh, that divine power, but at the same time they do not appreciate it. They do not necessarily respect Krishna the same way the Pandava brothers do. So Shakuni and Karna especially, uh, they treat Krishna as an enemy that is almost impossible to defeat, but they have to always keep watching out for. Now, uh, the sacrifice ends, but the story obviously does not. Uh, the Kaurva brothers return back to the palace of Hastinapura and now they are starting to brew their next plan on how to take down the Pandava brothers and how to get back the kingdom of Indraprastha too because life is not about fairness and as we all know war is inevitable when the ego is resolved uh, to relinquish control of the territory. So how that happens we are going to see in the next episode as we start discussing the game of dice which is perhaps the most uh, interesting parts of the story of the Mahabharata but until then God bless you all.